the events of World War II cast a shadow over the rest of the century and perhaps over the rest of history. And inevitably, they changed the course of Western art. In Europe, the unbelievable scale of the Nazi genocide against the Jews left Europeans with the task not only of restoring their broken cities, but of repairing their shattered culture. And in America, the explosion of the first atom bomb out here in the deserts of the Southwest meant that for the first time, the fears of medieval man might come true, that the entire world might be destroyed in a single terrifying apocalypse. It was against this background that the post-war artists created their art. While Europeans couldn't forget their past, in America, artists turned their backs on what they saw as the public and political dimension of art. The abstract expressionists, centered in New York, escaped to an interior world where the subjective landscape and the struggle with brushwork and pigment became the goal of painting. For the first time, Europe looked to New York. Abstract expressionism, abstract art, is part of Western tradition. It evolves out of it, it's part of it, it remains part of it. It's not oriental, it's not, uh, it's not a new tradition. Clement Greenberg, critic and promoter of the New York School, became their spokesman and a friend of the leading abstract expressionist, Jackson Pollock. I first met Jackson Pollock in 42. Came down the sidewalk and there was Lee Krasner, whom I'd known of old. And she was with a very respectable looking gentleman. And uh, I saw this rather nice looking guy. And Lee said to me, this fellow's gonna be a great painter. Okay. What finally hit me in Pollock's art was the portable mural he did for the apartment house in which Peggy Guggenheim lived. That hit me. It was the fir first time I saw him go all over, repeat, repeat this way. I thought that was a great painting, and I began to follow Pollock assiduously, you can say, after that. Raised in the American Southwest, Pollock was influenced by Indian sand painting. And in a sense, his works internalized the desert landscape itself. In New York, he studied the works of modern European masters, especially Miro and Picasso. I think he had his best run in 47, 48, 49, 50. The all over, what I call the all over, when he spattered or dripped or whatever. About his art, Pollock knew what he was about. He trusted his spontaneity, let's say what they call automatic painting. But he was in control. He'd stop from time to time to see what he'd done. And then when a picture was finished, he'd go back and edit now and then. When it comes to abstract art, there's no subject matter, but there is content, and the two have to be distinguished, subject matter and content. In other words, the presence or absence of a recognizable image has nothing to do with value in art. It doesn't have to be about anything. I gave it the title, Lavender Mist. Well, I saw it, and I flipped for it, and then I know all this predominant color was lavender, that kind of violet. And it was sort of a little misty. And so I suggested that to Jackson. He said, sure. He 
wasn't this wild, uh, heedless genius. No, he wasn't that. He looked. He looked hard, and he was very sophisticated about painting. The gesture of Pollock creates an arena for a personal drama. It is not a document of an historical and social tragedy. Instead, in Europe, the artist couldn't forget the trauma of the war. And each painting, each sculpture is full of scars, is full of uh, pain, is full of blood. It carries on the memory of death. The painting, It's How You Feel, by the French artist Fautrier, suggests the look of broken flesh, its blemishes and craters. The Italian artist Fontana literally attacked the clay, ripping its surface open. used scissors to stab these holes into the canvas. <laughs> <laughs> 